This week on The Watchmen, we head to the city of David, ancient Jerusalem, for an up-close look at where King David's palace may have stood some 3,000 years ago as he ruled over the kingdom of Israel. Plus, is this the city shining on a hill that Jesus referenced in the Gospel of Matthew? It said he went to the Decapolis cities, and this is the closest of the Decapolis cities to Capernaum. Oh. So he must have visited here. And it might be the reason why Susita has so many churches in it. We head to the shores of the Sea of Galilee to visit a fascinating archaeological site from the New Testament period. All that and much more, only right here on The Watchmen. And welcome to The Watchmen. We start off this week with another amazing archaeological discovery in Israel. A team of researchers at Tel Aviv University just released a report revealing that they may have found the world's oldest furnace. The researchers and archaeologists involved in the excavation believe the stunning find in Beersheba in southern Israel dates back some 6,500 years and was used for copper smelting. Now, smelting is a process where you apply heat to ore in order to extract silver, copper, iron, and other metals. In simpler terms, as one Israeli professor put it, you take a rock and turn it into shiny metal. Pretty amazing stuff, and for its time, cutting edge technology, which is interesting because Israel today is a major high-tech hub and center of innovation. Yet Israel's best days are still to come. In the book of Psalms, God says, I have sworn to David my servant. I will establish your line forever and make your throne firm through all generations. Then as now, Jerusalem was the capital of David's kingdom. And our good friend Zev Orenstein of the city of David, ancient Jerusalem, joined us recently from the very place that King David's palace may have stood some 3,000 years ago. Take a look. Jerusalem is a place of meaning, of inspiration, of faith. It's the place where the words of the Bible come to life. And yet, until recently, historically speaking, we had lost Jerusalem. When people thought, where is the Jerusalem of the Bible? Everyone was looking in the wrong place. So what we're going to do today is together explore the city of David. How is it lost? How was it rediscovered? And what are some of the incredible discoveries being unearthed here every single day that are showing that our shared connection to Jerusalem going back thousands of years is not simply a matter of faith, but a matter of fact. In 2005, where I'm standing right now is underground. Our visitor center was directly above my head. One morning, a woman by the name of Dr. Elat Mazar, a world-renowned archeologist, comes into our offices and says, you need to move your visitor center. We ask her why. She says, beneath your feet, you will find the palace of King David. Now it's one of those awkward moments. What do you say to that? So we said, Dr. Mazar, people have been digging in the city of David for nearly the last 150 years. No one's ever said that before. What makes you so certain that this is the place? So she says, first, very simply, the city of David is a city on a hill. And if you have a city on a hill, where will you expect to find the palace? At the top of the hill. Where I'm standing right now is the top of the city of David. She argued, this is where you'll find King David's palace. So he said, Dr. Mazar, perhaps 3,000 years ago, during the time of David, perhaps people built their palaces in the middle of the city. Maybe they built them at the bottom of the city. We are not going to move our visitor center simply because were you to be queen today, you would build your palace right here. What else do you have to support your theory? 
So Dr. Mazar shows us a discovery found here some 60 years ago on the slope that I'm standing atop right now, a royal Phoenician capital. Phoenicia is modern day Lebanon and a capital is a special stone that would have stood atop an ancient column or pillar in an important building. And Dr. Mazar said that this royal Phoenician capital proves that where we're standing right now is in fact the location of King David's palace. So he said, Dr. Mazar, what does a royal Phoenician capital have to do with David and where he built his palace? Maybe it teaches us something about the ancient Phoenicians, but, but that's about it. So she says to us, if you knew the Bible like I know the Bible, you wouldn't ask questions like that. So he said, well, clearly we don't. Please enlighten us. And she said, if you open up to the second book of Samuel, chapter 5, verse 11, King David has somehow managed to do the impossible. He has managed to conquer a city that the Bible tells us in the book of Joshua, in the book of Judges, in the book of Samuel, no one can conquer this hilltop until King David comes along. Exactly how David conquers this hilltop, how he makes Jerusalem the capital of Israel for these last 3,000 years, well, for that, you're going to have to come on an actual tour of the city of David. But Dr. Mazar says that if you continue in the story after King David conquers Jerusalem and makes Jerusalem his capital, what does it say next? That King David reached out to his neighbors in the north, the Phoenicians. And it says, King Hiram of Tyre sent envoys to David with cedar logs, carpenters, and stonemasons, and they built a palace for David. So Dr. Mazar says, why do we find a royal Phoenician capital here in the city of David? Because it was the Phoenicians who built David's palace. So he said, well, that's pretty compelling. So what happens next? Dr. Mazar from the Hebrew University, together with the Israel Antiquities Authority, the body that oversees all archeological excavation in the country, they come and they begin to dig. And they find to the north, to the east, walls more than 20 feet thick far thicker than the walls of the White House. And they realized that a massive structure would have been standing here thousands of years ago. But the question is, to what time period? Who was living here? Dr. Mazar finds at the base of the walls pottery, which she dates back, along with other organic material, to 3,000 years ago, to the time of King David. And she comes up with a theory that, based on the archeological evidence, based on the Bible together, we are standing in the place where King David's palace once stood. She announces this theory and scholars and archaeologists come and say, Dr. Mazar, show us the evidence, which she does. And some agree with her and say, yes, this could very well be King David's palace. Others say, Dr. Mazar, what you date to the time of David, we date to 100 years after David. So what's the debate surrounding where we're standing right now? It's not so much what this area was. There is near consensus that where I am standing right now was the royal government center of the Davidic dynasty, the original Capitol Hill, if you will. The question is more, was King David here or perhaps his grandson? Personally, it's not keeping me awake at night. The Davidic dynasty was ruling from here. Now, had you said to someone, Prior to 1993, I'm going to visit the city of David. There was a whole group of scholars known as the Copenhagen School. They would have said to you, the city of David? You mean King David? From the Bible? You would have said, well, of course, who else? Well, you know, they would say, historically speaking, there was no such person. Until an excavation in Israel's north, in a place called Tel Dan, a large stone inscription is discovered, dating to some 150 years after King David would have lived. And it was written by a man named King Hazael of Aram, who he himself is mentioned in the Bible in the second book of Kings. And this King Hazael was in a good mood. Why? The inscription tells us that he had just won a major military victory. Over who? Over a king from the house of David. And if there's a house of David, what does that mean? That means that there was, of course, a David. Now, the Bible tells us that King David ruled from Jerusalem. Now, here's what I can tell you with absolute certainty. King David never walked through the old city of Jerusalem. King David never put a note between the stones of the Western Wall. How can I be so certain? Very simple. That dates to 1,000 years after David would have lived. If, as the Bible says, that King David ruled from Jerusalem, where was Jerusalem during the time of David? Right here, where I'm standing in the city of David, the place where Jerusalem began.
fascinating stuff, and we're not done. Coming up after the break, we head to the shores of the Sea of Galilee, to the very place where Jesus may have given one of his most famous sermons. Folks, you will not want to miss this hidden gem of Israel. Don't move. KUFI's mission is to educate and empower millions of American Christians to speak with one voice in defense of Israel and the Jewish people. There's several ways you can learn more about Israel every day through KUFI's dynamic resources. The KUFI Coffee Break is a weekly bite-sized Israel lesson delivered to your email inbox. Dive into topics like the forgotten Jewish refugees, Israel's agricultural communities called kibbutzim, and the Hamas rocket threat with options to dig deeper each week. Every lesson can be read in under five minutes while you're making a cup of coffee. Plus, stay informed on all the latest news out of Israel and how it affects you by subscribing to KUFI's Daily Briefing. It's a daily news roundup of important Israel-related headlines, so you're always up to date when it comes to Israel. Follow KUFI on Facebook, YouTube, and Instagram for daily content, including videos, news articles, breaking news, devotionals, fun facts, and more. And welcome back. It's one of Israel's best kept secrets, a massive archeological site overlooking the Sea of Galilee and dating back to the time of Jesus. Get ready, because Watchman correspondent Raj Nair and our good friend Danny the Digger Herman are about to take us on a journey through the mysterious ruins of Hippos Susita, a site that many believe has major significance in the ministry of Jesus. Well, Danny, it's always a pleasure to have you on The Watchman. My pleasure and honor to be on the show. And today we're in a fascinating archeological mountain, really. And speaking from personal experience, not many tourists get to come here. Yes. It's called Susita. I don't really see that much in my Bible, but it's, it might be mentioned, if you will. Tell us the story of this place. Well, for one thing, let's make it clear. It's not mentioned by name in the Bible. And it is personally for me, my favorite secret hidden gem. <laughs> it's really a site that is so beautiful, such an amazing view, wait till we get to the edge. And yet it's not yet officially open to the public. Even the road here is not officially open. Oh, so this is really VIP. Yes, this is a, a secret spot that only those who knows the, into the small details will know to, way, to get up here. And in short, the site was uh, founded in Hellenistic times, but its golden area would be the Roman and mm -hmm. the Christian times. Gotcha. It was probably settled by the soldiers of the generals inheriting the kingdom of Alexander the Great. Mm. But why did they all favor it? I mean, even from here, you can see on both sides, there are, there's a steep valley, okay, that it's gives like you a, protection. It's a bit like Masada. Impregnable fortress, basically. And totally. It was very well guarded, very well protected with tower. Even today, by the way, there are minefields because of the time that Israel held this. And on the ridges around us, there were Syrians. Huh. That was the reality here until 1967. And look, here you have a bunker from the 1950s and 60s when uh, the Israelis held this hill. But it was an important strategic location to protect the kibbutz, kibbutz and give behind us. Makes total sense. Now you can start to see the Sea of Galilee. Yes. You're and, right, you're right there. Yes, and only in the 1990s, uh, Haifa University started working here uncovering, first of all, where we are walking. At the Kumanos. I was about to say this how I mean this is not a new road. This, this is, is from the second or third century CE. Wow. This is nearly a two thousand year old road. <laughs> Why is this place important for the Christian world? Well, for one thing, the, not the site, but the city as part of a, of a political treaty is mentioned in the New Testament. Not by its name, but if you remember when Jesus camps in Capernaum. Which is just over there. Just on the other side of the, of the lake. He anchors there for at least three years. And then he walks around, he travels, he spreads his messages. And it says, in the Jewish towns in their synagogues. He goes as far as Tyre and Sidon and in the Decapolis. Mm. Now, what is Decapolis? 
you know this one, right? Ten cities. Decapolis, ten cities. Most of these cities today are in Jordan. Damascus is in Syria, but two cities are in Israel. Hmm. Betchan, Niseskitopolis. Where Saul was hanged. Also in the Old Testament days. Mm -hmm. And this place. Wow. Hippo Susita was its full name. And being so, uh, here is a place where a Christian pilgrim to s can see one of those cities which uh, Jesus may have visited. He may have actually walked, maybe not on this pavement, because it's from a later time, but on the, on the though, pavement that preceded this one. Still though, Danny, you can't do that to me, man. I woo, get weak in the knees. <laughs> and look what happened here. Oh my goodness. This was uncovered already in the 1950s. Wow. This is a cathedral from Byzantine wow. times. The Roman city, like all the other Roman cities, both here and anywhere else, they all become Christian cities. And as I'm going to show you, it's only one of four churches that were found here. Now, look at the details. Look at the columns. This is not local limestone mm -hmm. or, or basalt. It's imported marble and granite and green marble. It's amazing how much wealth was brought here. Just the weight of these things. These were carried about a thousand kilometers to, to decorate the city. Time out. You're saying these very columns were brought from a thousand kilometers away? Yes. From quarries in Turkey, in Greece, in Tunisia. Yes. How is that even possible? A Roman power. <laughs> Traveling to Israel, the land of the Bible, is a once-in-a-lifetime experience that will revolutionize your life. This month, we're bringing Israel to you with Kufai's new Promised Land mini-book. While you may not have had the opportunity to physically step foot in this sacred land, we want you to discover Israel for yourself in a powerful way. Kufai's Promised Land booklet will bring the Holy Land to life and transform you. And this month, it's yours with your gift of any amount. On every page, you'll visit important biblical and historical sites within Israel that will transport you to the land of the Bible. Learn the historical and present day significance of major sites in Israel. From the Sea of Galilee to Jerusalem, see the scriptures unfold before your very eyes as you follow in the footsteps of our Redeemer. Visit www.kufi.org slash promised land and receive your copy today. When you see a place like Susita, you it, you don't feel that far removed from the people that probably walked on these streets. No, I totally identify with them. But what really made the site famous just recently is a church ahead of us where in the last season, they found decoration on the floor, which alludes to the miracle of the multiplication of loaves and fish. Oh my goodness. Okay, there's really tangible history here that relates to very events that happen around the corner. This is too good. And I've been noticing these columns, it almost looked like they fell together, like they all were pushed over at the same yes, time. Yes, especially in the cathedral, you see it, that all of the columns uh, seem to have fallen in the same direction. Yes. Uh, I spoke to Eric about this at Bet Shean. The site ends brutally in a devastating earthquake mm. that causes the whole city to fall flat on its face. Wow. What's interesting is that in Bet Shean, it fell in one direction, and here it fell in the opposite direction teaching us that Bechan belonged to the African plate, and this is part of the Arab plate, and they simply move like that. Now, I want to go back to one thing that you said. You said Jesus walked through the Decapolis. Now, a lot of those are in Jordan, pretty far away. One's in Syria, but one of them is right here, and what makes that so interesting is there's Capernaum, there's yeah. Tiberias. This is where his ministry was. This is yeah. the closest of those Decapolis cities. So, I know you can't say it 99%, but you could probably guess that Jesus was here. He, it said he went to the Decapolis cities, and this is the closest of the Decapolis cities to Capernaum. Oh. So he must have visited here. Even that the text doesn't say it, it is so sensible. And it might be the reason why Susita has so many churches in it. There's one here, there's one there. I showed you already the cathedral, and they just found another one down on the slope here. Okay, this city became extremely Christian from the fourth century and on. Mm. But I think there's even a better, almost magical connection that one can make here to Jesus. 
I think that Jesus uh, uh, pointed his hand to this site in a specific text that you're probably familiar with. Danny, this is an obnoxiously beautiful view. Especially at this hour, look at this. So why'd you bring me up here? What were you alluding to? Well, for one thing, again, this site is so important uh, in the context of the New Testament. Just around the corner, by the way, is the site identified as where Jesus casted demons out of the possessed men. He, he, they entered swine who ran and drowned into the Sea of Galilee. Just over there. Okay, and the Decapolis uh, is this. Okay, this is one of the cities of the Decapolis. But I think one can make even a closer connection to one of Jesus' sayings. And that's in the most famous speech that he gave, the Sermon on the Mount. Okay, Matthew chapter 5 records Jesus going on a high mountain above Capernaum. Capernaum right. is just on the other side there. Okay. I see where you're going with this. Verse 14, you are the light of the world. Okay, uh, an image that is known also from the Dead Sea Scrolls about sons of light. Now he wants to demonstrate this. So he keeps saying a city that is on a hill cannot be hidden. Now let's think about this for a minute. If you're sitting there and you want to demonstrate what it means a city that is on a hill, wh where would you point to? So one option is to point to Tiberias, that's a city, but it ain't on a hill. Mm. Where do you have a city on a hill visible from Capernaum? There are actually two candidates. One is Gamla, a city behind us, and the other one is right here. Danny the Digger, I cannot thank you enough. My pleasure. Really my pleasure to, to illustrate the text and make it so lively like this. This is for me also quite a rewarding moment. Up next, my final thoughts on how the Bible is coming to life today and why you should be encouraged. Stick around. Education without a moral compass is this. This too is part of education. And so we must make sure that we begin the educational process with a moral compass. Join Holocaust survivor and historian Irving Roth on a once-in-a-lifetime remembrance tour through Poland. His story of loss, survival, and hope will bring the pages of history to life. As you walk through the streets of the infamous Warsaw Ghetto, the silent barracks of Nazi death camps like the one where Irving slept and the memorials to the heroes who risked their lives to rescue their Jewish neighbors from Hitler's evil plan, you will be inspired and challenged to put your faith into action. Take advantage of this rare opportunity to walk with and learn from Irving Roth as he takes you on a journey of his memories of life before, during, and after the Holocaust. To register for this historic trip to Poland with Kufi and Irving Roth, Go to the KUFI website and sign up today. Welcome back. Folks, we love to bring you these incredible archaeological discoveries out of Israel like we did on today's show. They're coming so frequently now that it's really hard to keep up. From Jerusalem to Beersheba to Galilee, Israeli archaeologists are uncovering ancient finds every day that bring the Bible to life. And none of this is by coincidence. When you combine this irrefutable archaeological and scientific evidence with biblical truth, you have an unbeatable combination. God is revealing himself more and more every day, and one of the ways he is doing it is through biblical archaeology. The stones are literally crying out, as Jesus said they would, and our team at Christians United for Israel realizes that we are living in Bible times, and that Israel is at the center of what God is doing in the world today. We are the world's largest pro-Israel organization with over 10 million members and growing every day. You see the information there on your screen, so call or click and join our movement today for such a time as this. While you're at it, be sure to follow us on social media and subscribe to our YouTube channel to get exclusive Watchmen content that you will not see anywhere else. Thanks for joining us this week on The Watchmen. Until next time, God bless you. And remember, never hold your peace.